Ladies and gentlemen, it's 2024 and the business of cyber series is back on. I'm your host, Ted Gutierrez. Really excited to, uh, to be back after about 10 days of vacation. And we're going to kick off this business of cyber series with a really awesome uh, conversation with somebody who I think is a leader in the ICS space as far as LinkedIn and content is concerned. We're going to be talking about top ways to get into OT and ICS cybersecurity. And before we do, just if this is the first time that you're joining us, first of all, thank you very much. I think we had over 240 registrants for this event, and uh, we're really excited to be talking to you. If this is your first time joining or if this is uh, a show that you've been watching for a long time, allow me to reintroduce the entire concept of the business of Cyber Series, which is CISOs, OT directors, IT directors working in the critical sector spaces. We had a hypothesis going back all the way to 2020 that we put into a podcast in early 2023. And that was, there aren't enough resources available for maturity programs to take flight the way that the security leaders designed. And that because there's either not enough budgets, um, there's not enough time, or there really aren't enough people. And so this entire concept of connecting business outcomes to cybersecurity in my book, and a lot of my peers, it's the path to get more of those resources. And so what we do over the course of 20 episodes in 2023 is we try to bring to light the conversations that will help these security practitioners, these asset owners on that journey. And I'm excited to share that today we have somebody that's going to help us do that uh, named Mike Holcomb, who I'll introduce here shortly. Uh, the format for the overall uh, experience is... Obviously, this is every single Tuesday, we have the Business of Cyber Series, um, and we're always going to be bringing a topic to try to connect business outcomes to cybersecurity. What we're going to be looking at today with Mike is all the different resources that he's personally put together to help someone enter the ICS realm. Now, throughout this exercise, I can actually see comments that you make. And if you're okay with it, go ahead and share. Hey, I'm okay with you sharing this. If it's a really good question or a really good comment, we can actually put it on the screen for everybody else to see. Um, give us a thumbs up. Give us a like. Please share this information with those who you think it might be valuable. Uh, and we look forward to uh, spending the next 40 to 45 minutes with you. With that, I'm going to introduce, uh, I'm going to let into the show, uh, Mr. Mike Holcomb. Mike, thanks so much for joining. And uh, how are you doing on this 2024? I'm good, Ted. To help it too. Yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. I appreciate it for uh, for the invite and and everybody for uh, tuning in. Yeah. No, it's my pleasure. I I think I told you in the pre-show I haven't been feeling well at all for the last couple of days. But when I looked at the amount of attendees and I knew it was you going to be here, I said, "There's no possible way I'm going to Mike and saying we're going to reschedule." So we could with, have with voice. I know we could have, but you know what? Folks are out there. They're putting their time towards watching this show and. Uh, you know, I think this information is important, right? That you and sure. I were talking in the pregame about, about a conversation that we had earlier last year. I was talking a little bit more about the resources because we haven't met personally, although I'm, I'm a big racing fan. So South Carolina, I'm going to make it out there sometime this year. Uh, Definitely. We'll get together. But tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience and, and, and where you, uh, you know, how did you find yourself? kind of fitting into the role that I will go out and state with almost 20,000 followers on LinkedIn and awesome, awesome content. How did you get into this? And what's what's kind of the goal of what you do every day for this community? Sure. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I, uh, I've i actually been a longtime computer nerd uh, since, since day one. I actually grew up. My best friend was uh, kind of the traditional computer hacker. And so I was a really good boy and I never did anything bad but i would watch him <laughs> so he would be you know cracking games to be able to copy them or writing cheat codes for unlimited gold or for unlimited lives in a game i was just always fascinated and um and i can tell you stories but probably nothing to uh to rebroadcast <laughs> and it, just a real you know interesting character and i always thought and he was like the nicest guy you would ever meet and i always kept thinking you know well what would you know somebody with you know malicious intent you know do what would the bad people do if they had these skills and and this knowledge so it just always stuck with me and so as i got into it it just security was always there in the, in the background and everything I did 
And fortunately, about 25 years ago, I, I had a, my first full-time job in, in cyber uh, and then ran, you know, a couple of IT cybersecurity shops over, over the years. Uh, and then in 2010, when Stuxnet happened, and for those of you that aren't familiar, Stuxnet is when we had one nation state or, or two nation states, the, the United States and Israel had created the first known piece of ICS specific malware to target a uranium uh, enrichment facility in Natanz, Iran. And, and at that point, that was kind of the the set the, the stage was set you know at the at the global level for not only nation state on nation state cyber warfare but there was also that ICS or OT component as well where you had the the Americans and the Israelis created this malware to physically break down those centrifuges that were enriching the uranium over over time gas but and and, and also hide from the operators at the facility what was actually going on behind the scenes. So it's this technical marvel that uh, they have put together and still is considered you know, one of you know, the, the most uh, technical pieces of malware that we've probably ever ever seen. And but I was always fascinated with that. And then it just got me starting to, to wonder, well, how does cybersecurity work at a power plant? And so then I started reaching out to people and asking those questions and you know people in cybersecurity teams in and around the industries or just engineers that worked at power plants I had you know friends of friends and nobody wanted to have those conversations back in 2010 2011 20, 2012 um, which was unfortunate about the same time I fell into my role at floor uh, and I had no idea what we did when we when I took that job uh, and uh, and then it just turned out that I happened to work at one of the world's largest engineering and construction companies. And so I work with some of the world's greatest engineering minds. And after about a year of sinking into, you know, the regular, you know, kind of, this is your new job and this is your new role. I, I uh, realized, yeah, we probably have some control systems around here. And then turns out, you know, we build and we design and, and sometimes we operate some of the largest control system environments in the world. Wow. And, and so, yeah, I just really had lucked into that, that position. And so I've been very fortunate, uh, you know, to be at floor and, and have the experience that, that I do and work with the, the, the people that I, I do and, and learn so much every yeah. day. And, and then I just always go back to when I started trying to get into ICS or OT, OT cybersecurity, it was very frustrating. And it was just wall after wall after wall and getting wow. shut down. And then it's just, you didn't know where to go. There weren't resources. And so I kind of, my goal with putting the resources together that I, I do today is really, whether it's on LinkedIn or YouTube, or it's, it's just a matter of helping people, um, whether they want to get into the field and then they don't have to feel that frustration like I did, you know, back, in, a, back in the day. It's and, a truly organic growth. I mean, you lived it. Yeah, exactly. And then there's also in in and and also helping people that are in the field and helping them secure their environments from attack because the the last thing I want is is whether it's you know potentially somebody dying uh, because of a cyber security uh, attack in in a facility or just at the end of the day you you don't want to lose whatever that facility is designed to produce. Right? I always right. talk about you know if a power plant goes down for a couple of hours it's not the end of the world, but if it's a couple of days or a couple of weeks or, you know, so on and so forth, then you start to think of what the repercussions look like there. And that's, you know, that's a big part of ICS and OT cybersecurity is not only protecting lives and the environment uh, in which these, these sites live and breathe essentially, but, you know, making sure that we're, uh, ensuring the availability of of whatever that site is designed to produce. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I I understand what you mean. When I uh, when I was at Shell, I actually started in quality engineering and doing audits, and then that went into from quality control over to quality assurance, and then that turned into risk. And it was actually when I um, similar to you, I didn't I wasn't a, a, 
a cyber expert when I left there. It was actually when I owned a chemical company that I started to recognize how important all of these critical systems are to the way that the business functions, right? And so I've always had a very good, uh, you know, as a CEO of a product company, I'm always thinking about resources um, and I'm, you know, talking to people in the space about how many different solutions they're trying to implement, how much training they're trying to get their team to do. And so I think you and I, and we aligned on this back in December when we spoke, you know, the... I think that we owe it as a community in whatever our general expertise is or the specific expertise to give back to that community. So I'm excited to have these, uh, you know, a lot of the different resources that you have. Let's, let's show what they, let's show, let's show the team here what we, what you came up with. So we've got a couple slides that, that the team can, that the, the viewers can now see. We got some on newsletters. We got something on YouTube videos. We got something on, you know, your top 10 posts of all time. We got something on the, what are the two top things IT and OT leaders should be doing and then the next eight. So let's go one by one and have a little conversation about each one. Um, tell us about the ebook and the newsletter and guarding the gears. Sure, yeah, maybe start with the newsletter uh, first. And that's just, just something sure. I put together really as a quick email that goes out Sunday mornings. It's really just a kind of quick highlight for the, the week. And it's pretty much my top post from the week. It's a what the kind of the top video or article that I kind of found the most interesting and worthwhile for, for the week. And, and then usually the, the top podcast episode that I caught during the week. And, and that's it. It's really just meant kind of short, sweet, simple, you know, to the point. Yeah. Um, for the the ebooks, I started putting these together because the one question I always get asked more than anything by far is how do I get started in 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 industrial cyber, and so I you know kept answering questions over and and over, which is great to get so many people interested in in the field and be able to help out, and then it was you know what I just put this in these 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 little ebooks. I started writing a much bigger book, which probably will still happen one day, but at the same time, it's, you know, that's later for down the road. And I wanted to get something out that, that people could reference. And then it became very clear as I started writing the first one, it's, you know, and you see this, if you go to different courses or, you know, classes in, in ICS, OT, cybersecurity, you have IT people in, in the room and you have OT people typically in the right. room and, and we come from different paths. Sure. And so there's there's this idea that at least to get started in the field, it it there's different approaches depending on your on your background. And and so that's where the book focuses, you know, on the first, well, there's 10 steps for each one. The first two are different between IT and OT, and then the last last eight are the same for for everybody once we're all on the, the same page. And and right have it here on the the slide but you can see for for it and and versus you know i always hate the term it versus ot but we should say it and ot this became readily apparent when i took my first sans ics course i remember and this this goes back almost 10 years <laughs> and and i was sitting in the room and there's there's probably about 80 90 90 people right. and in their the intro intro course and I found it fascinating because yeah, it was you know, they did introductions and it was was half IT people, it was half OT folks. And the first question, a gentleman I remember in the front right had had asked, and it was like a really simple networking question. And I thought, wow, that's I can answer that. Like I, I know everything about ICS. <laughs> and but it was the way he asked the question was completely different than I would have ever right. thought. And right. it was because he was an engineer in a in a water treatment facility. You know, yeah. He works. He looks at things completely different. Than, Steel toes and hard hats. Would. Yeah, I exactly. mean, I think it's, it's um, OT versus IT, OT convergence. So we're aiming to have two different episodes soon. Why convergence is necessary and why convergence will never happen. And there's very very passionate schools of thought on that sure. you know i feel like a couple of the different analyst groups out there i don't know if it was forrester or gartner one of the two said that 70 to 80 percent of cyber purchases for whether it's services or products are all going to come from an it oriented leader because 
to your point, let's talk about the 2010s, the 2012s, the 2015s. That's when a lot of ICS specific training started coming out, certifications, guidelines, frameworks. So it's, it's, it's fair to recognize that a lot of your CISOs today actually didn't grow up being OT oriented cybersecurity professionals. Do you agree? Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah so I think that's, and when you have like these structures of how products are evaluated, products are implemented, budgets are allocated, man, I tell you, you could look at the five chemical companies and five uh, food and bev companies and the way that they think about their OT and their IT, the way they think about their cyber kind of investments. I think we're living in an era where everybody's doing it a little bit differently. There's a mm -hmm. lot of passion around this is the right way. But the truth is, I think you'd agree, Mike, if the, if the business wants to have OT and IT separated or they want to have them together, this is the slide that is most important. It's, it doesn't really matter how they approach it. What matters is how they're talking to their team about how they should be walking into work every day. And so I found this slide to be pretty valuable. It's like, you got a bunch of IT folks, you have to learn how critical systems work. If you have a bunch of OT folks that have only just kept things moving and never really shut down for anything, um, you know, they're, they're wondering why are we patching every single thing all the time, right? Uh, at all right. costs. So I think we agree. I mean, it's not OT versus IT. I think it's more about getting the right leadership to recognize that OT can learn IT, IT can learn OT. Maybe not. Yeah, no, I think it, yeah, it's it's a matter of everybody can learn. It's it's whether they want to, <laughs> right? And and if and sometimes they need they need the boss to be able to support them and and give them the the opportunity to 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 learn. Well, you one know, thing I, is, I mean, every every security practitioner right now, if I think if you asked, at least in the critical sectors, hey, do you have enough time to accomplish your roadmap right now? I think the answer would be a laugh and a no, right? Right. So it, where it always will be, right? Where are they going to get the time to do all this training, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's very, very cool. Very cool. So real quick question before we slip to the next uh, three through 10. Are you able to share the title of your book that you're working on or at least the focus? Yeah. Well, it probably actually will be getting started with industrial cybersecurity. I think oh, that's, probably. yeah, because I always, I always go for something with, you know, like practical in the title, but there's our, that's already every, like Pascal Ackerman has practical industrial cybersecurity and, mm -hmm. and, and some other, you know, there's, there's plenty of those out there. So, or I might completely just do something else. I've, I've, you know, got probably a couple chapters written, um, and it's be, starting to become another kind of general intro, but there, there's actually already intro books out there. So, um, right. I might might shift gears. You know, I also focus, you know, in doing maturity assessments and and the training and the risk assessments and pen testing and and incident detection and response. So, might do something more more dedicated. Uh, right now, I'm just you know, really building training and courses around those those different topics. So, I think it's a, I think, I think that's, it's a topic that's not read. I don't think there's enough content out there. And, I think viewers will see all the content that you have. It's amazing. You can have the same piece of content, but you can just cut it up three different ways. And people learn differently, some sure. by video, some by, you know, classroom and some by reading, writing. So I look forward to seeing it. Um, as we look at, you know, you, you said that IT folks should learn a little bit about the OT world, same vice versa for the OT, but then you collaborated on the next, you know, three through, uh, through 10 here. I'm going to make it a little bit larger. Tell us about number three, explore training options. And let's just go throughout, throughout all of them. Yeah. And this, and, and you can see number three is very different than number 10, where we talk about getting certified, even though that's right. probably the other biggest question I get is around certification, but really it's, it's how do we get knowledge? How do we learn about cybersecurity in industrial or OT environments? And so, you know, there's there's some great free training that Idaho National Labs and, and CISA makes available. Uh, and and I guess thanks to COVID, it's it's all free and online, and you don't have to be a U.S. citizen to take it. So so it's wide open for everybody to take. So so there's a lot of great free options that are out there. Um, yeah, I've been very fortunate to work 
you know, for a company that sends me to, to SANS. And, and I've, I've been going to SANS courses for 20 years at this point. Um, right. And I'm very fortunate in, in love that opportunity to learn but i i realize not everybody has that opportunity as well especially you know these days at, at ten thousand dollars a class and, and a certification exam uh, that's not affordable you know for for most people and so that was another big reason why i put the the youtube videos and the, the class together that it to be able to share that with with people that again they're they want to get into to ICSOT, but but don't know where to start, and yeah, they just can't make it to a, a ten thousand dollar course. I mean, the SANS courses are amazing, and they're delivered by amazing people like Rob Lee. Um, you cannot, you know, if I had ten thousand dollars today, I'd go retake his class because just sitting in the same room for him with him for a week, I mean, that's well worth it. But again, most people don't have have that money for for class. So right. So right. yeah. So so yeah. We want to you know find training that's out there. There's a lot of great books. Uh, there's a lot of great resources. There's a lot of great people to to follow on social media. Uh, social media like you know LinkedIn. Uh, that's my my main focus between LinkedIn and and uh, and YouTube. So. Well, I mean, you know, it's interesting training options for learning. You know, I think there's a a very healthy percentage of uh of our community that believes that you could go get every training course you could get every certification you could have an endless budget and if you haven't actually spent time solving those critical cyber control issues or implementing solutions you know you're not you're not really going to learn so it's interesting sure. how much do you think i'm not even going to say maybe the word is diy but let's say you spent a year just going to nothing but courses with you know pr with you know, experience from the classroom versus somebody that's spending a year working on a cyber team on really critical projects and assets. How would you recommend somebody young that's coming into the industry? How do they balance that? How, how do they balance what they're aiming for? It's a good question, especially if somebody young, you know, they, they got probably a little bit more energy and bandwidth to really, you know, be able to dedicate with and, and probably less distractions, right? Less family obligations and such that where they can just dive in and they can spend the sure. time learning and, and maybe building out a home lab, right? Going and purchasing a, a PLC. Uh, whether it's on eBay or or kind of a newer model like a automation direct, the Click PLC line is we say relatively affordable for you can buy a fully loaded one for four hundred dollars, and they do a really great job of providing training uh, materials for for that line. So yeah, but yeah, being able to get that knowledge, getting the the hands on with things like PLC programming, I think is an essential step for people to to really get that at least that initial foundation to, to start in in industrial cyber. And then until, and this was for me, I'm, I took that first SANS course and I had lots of conversations with engineers at the office, but until I stepped foot right. onto an actual site into an energized power plant that we were still in the process of commissioning, um, I knew nothing. <laughs> I knew absolutely nothing until I was on site, you know, in the steel toe boots and the hard hat and the safety vest and safety glasses and electricity just all around me. And right. that's right. when it it really it started to to sink in. Yeah. So I also encourage people to to reach out to different companies and and ask for whether it's a tour or some type of there's a mentorship program that's another great thing about linkedin you can use linkedin to find people especially in your area you know not drive across the country to find a power plant to go visit but you try somebody a water treatment facility right they're they're everywhere um and they're usually smaller shops and a lot of times they'd be more than happy to to give you a tour. Sometimes they'd be more than happy to have you come and volunteer at least your time. It's another you know suggestion I have. Even if you can't find a paid internship somewhere, you know one of the best ways to get experience is volunteer. A lot of these organizations, right? These owners, these asset operators, they're small environments. They're begging for help. They don't have enough people because they don't like you mentioned. They don't have the budget, and right. so they'll take the help. And, take, and that's one way well, to, to gain experience. Well, I think you have to be in a position. I mean, there's an element of passion 
in everything that you're doing. I mean, you have to be passionate about, I, I don't even want to know how much time you invest in developing all this content, which we'll, we'll show more of. It's, it's a big, uh, on behalf of you, I can tell you it's, it's a lot of work to put this out, but there's an element of, uh, want and desire that I think e e continues to, to be interwoven in what you're saying. You know, it's interesting, the cyber community, I don't think has a ton of people that don't want to be into it. You know, you see some people in banking, you see some people in, 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 uh, in maybe healthcare or engineering, and they don't love their work. I think that it, would you agree that there's a positive correlation with how much you can learn and how valuable you could be to an organization and how much you kind of enjoy this work of cybersecurity? Most definitely. And I think that's where you find, yeah, people like anywhere, but, but yeah, especially in cyber where they have that, that passion you know, to, right. to be there for, for whatever reason. And, 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 and solving those problems. Right. Um, I think yeah. And I think, you know, some people, sometimes it's still people that are there for the money. A lot of times, like in ICS, it's, Hey, we want to protect the world. Right. We right. want to make sure you, people stay safe. You know, in, in, in IT cyber, I, for me, it was always, I want to protect the organization because if the organization gets hit and people are going to get laid off. Right. And right. I want to make sure people's jobs are protected. I mean, that business was my, impacts, right? I mean, yeah, it's, exactly. that was my big driver, you know, when I first got started. I see a lot of people when you mentioned it earlier, but jumping right to number 10, like, Hey, what are the top certifications I need to get started? Not a bad question. Right. But if it's okay. rooted in, certifications are an important component of my growth and my mentor has said so that's one thing i think some people just make a very poor assumption that because they're going to get certified on something or because they deployed the capital to go get a course uh if, if they don't if they're not actively trying to connect their activities to some larger positive end state i i, I think that uh i don't think they'll they'll fly i don't i don't think they're they're folks that are willing to go and sacrifice their time. Right. So one of the, yeah, it's, yeah, I know when I'm hiring somebody for a job, right. That's you can usually spot the people, right. That, that are, are just there trying to get the job versus those that want to be there or even need to be there. And, and of course we want to hire the people that need to be there. And if we can't get that, okay, we'll take the people that want to be there. You know, yeah. and, and, and then we kind of go from, go from there. <laughs> well, if we could bounce to number uh, I mean, we've bounced around a little bit, talked about hands-on experience. We continue to talk about the community. Let, let's talk about mentorship. A um, couple folks that uh, my co-founder, Sharice Esparza, had a mentor when she was at Enbridge Energy that actually took her out to assets, flew on the helicopter, got out there, did all the training. Awesome. And it was seven or eight years after she had already been in ICS Cyber. It was going out um to those assets wearing the hard hat it just changed her and she then took folks later in life and i uh i talked to a CISO from a major drilling company that did the same thing last yeah. week you know how do you help somebody that's young in a company or trying to enter a company find that mentor what 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 guidance would you give to those individuals because we i, I think you'd agree how imperative it is to see that that leadership role kind of explained, this is why you're doing this and this is what you're really helping solve. Yeah, no, I completely agree. It, and it's challenging. And I, I've been in that position, right? Trying to, to find a, a mentor, you know, somebody right. to help guide me down that, that path. And, and I think one of the, the biggest thing really I can, can recommend to people is, is don't get frustrated when, you get no's. You kind of feel like a salesperson, always, always hearing no. I think, uh, and you have to just not take it personally, because not everybody they just don't have the bandwidth. And I, I get a lot of requests every week um, for it's you know actually. helping people and mentoring, and I feel horrible when I have to say no. I just. I just don't have that that bandwidth and I wish I could. I mean, that's partly why I wrote the books. Um, because you know, whenever I ask, I say, like, hey, read these books, it, come back and ask me questions afterwards if you have anything particular in mind. But 
Mm-hmm. But yeah, it's so, but there are people out there that you will eventually connect with and that they do have the the time and and to be able to to take you under their wing and and help you learn. Uh, and then especially in ICS, I think it's it's essential because especially those that are in kind of just like you're mentioning, you know, that are in those environments and they can bring you in once you know, once you step foot in in an in ICS you know, or an OT environment, even even if it's a, a manufacturing plant, it's just it opens up the the world, I think, inside your mind and all the the pieces start to to click into place. Yeah, I think you have to be part of the organization, truthfully. I get emails like ultimately that probably not as much as you um, uh, because I'm not as, as technical of an expert as you and a lot of your peers, but people will actually ask, Hey, can I get a mentor? How do I start getting a mentor? And I, unfortunately, I think mentorship is an 80, 20 rule, 80% of w- the chances of a mentor reaching out to somebody is the mentor saying that's somebody I want to mentor. Right? So, Right. The guidance I've always given to people is um, be part of the of the basketball team, like get get into a company, um, even if it's not the right position, even if it's not exactly where you want to be. But being inside mm-hmm. the organization gives you an understanding of the landscape. Um, and, and I think that sure. zero to one is, is the hardest step, you know, one to yeah. two, two to three. And what I mean by that is, um, as a military, ex-military guy, people always ask, how did you find yourself in this sort in this world? Well, I always say that your first jump into a given industry is just going to teach you more about that industry and that you're going to move right. from that job to where you really want to be. And it's actually your third job where you really feel like you're, you're in the right place and you can't reach that third level. You can't reach that level of acumen or excitement or mentorship unless you get through the other two. So, mm-hmm. You know, I think we we live in a culture where a lot of people want the immediate answer. They want their immediate job. A lot of people spent tons of resources going to the right schools, but you know, getting into that job, they may have to take a, a trip around the corner. So, um, let's talk about soft skills. What do you mean by build relevant soft skills as it relates to entering or growing within the ICS community? I, I'm really interested in that one. Sure, I think we got there's a, the common soft skill conversation, but I, I really the for me the biggest focus is we always talk about you know the ability to uh, build bridges, and, and that goes back to we talked you know real briefly, and uh, we touch on this idea of IT versus OT, right, right. right. and right. and we see it you know, far too often. And I, and I get to, you work in a lot of environments, whether it's through my day job, or I, I get a lot of calls from folks, even CISOs in some of the largest environments, especially in the U.S., um, mm-hmm. that just have a conversation about what's going on in, the, in their environment. And I get to hear all the, the great things and, and all the, the horror stories, you know, and it, it's really this, it really comes down to, I always talk about, it's, a lot of times we hear it's you're from the IT side of the house, right? I still get that, mm-hmm. uh, even though I've been trying to be in OT for you know, well, almost 15 years now. Um, right. There's the OT side of the house, and but at the end of the day, we're we're both in the it's the same house. We all live under the same roof. We want to protect the the house from from the attackers, right? From something bad happening. So why aren't we working together? And so there are a lot of environments out there that really struggle because it is this IT versus OT mentality kind of mindset. Yeah, it's it's really sad and and it's so apparent when when you now go when I go into an environment, it's like oh, you guys are not talking to each other. You are not exactly. working together. It's yeah, not a it's, lot of middle ground. It either, I, I see people who are either, let's say 10% are actually working together. They're sharing budgets. They're sharing knowledge. They, they have a common syntax, if you will, which I think is super important. Yep, sure. But like 70% of people either don't know their counterparts on that side, or they just recognize that's not my field of study. That's not my area of expertise. I don't, we don't talk to them. And then I think 20% is out there trying to do it, but they don't have the, leadership at the top. Um, It's interesting because, you know, looking at number four, learn standards and regulations, there's so many now. I'm actually a proponent 
the, the hardest thing to do is the soft skills. The hardest thing to do is to understand, okay, we're all a team. If we can agree on what the business outcome we're trying to achieve is or avoid, um, we can apply a ton of different products, services, acumen. We can deploy tons of different frameworks and standards and regulations, risk models. That's the easy part because there's so many of them out there. I think that I, I tend to agree that I would actually state that understanding the soft skills and being able to deploy those to your left and right, whether the left is uh, safety engineers, physical security engineers that you, that you undoubtedly have to work with, um, or if it's CFOs and financial people, or if mm. it's some sort of procurement folks, you know, if you really want to secure your environment, you're going to need products and services. You have, those require budget. They require implementation mm. time times. They, you're going to have to get training. And I've never seen an IT or an OT organization magically snap its fingers and, and get all the resources in the form of budget. They have to work with right. the asset owners themselves. Yeah. I, think it's a, I think it's the number one thing people can do to move faster up the chain in ICS. It's my personal belief. Definitely. Yeah, I, I, I think so. It, really, to move up any chain, right? In, in, of course. Really, in any field or any business, most most definitely. Yeah. Well, I, I think I, IT and OT have actually moved. If you think about IT and OT and cybersecurity budgets 15 years ago, are they not different today where it requires way more soft skills because cybersecurity is such a business problem than it did previously? Or do you think it's it's always been important and relatively the same? It's a, it's a good question. I think it's <laughs> a couple of different ways. Maybe I think they, sorry, there's my poor dog is, there's a lot of thunder. <laughs> oh, hey. Poor, That's poor special. dog is scared. Yeah. Say hi he, to everybody. Help, he helps you write all your content. It's but, all good. No, the question was does. does cybersecurity professionals today need more soft skills than they did a decade ago? And if so, why, Mike? Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the need's always been there. And I think, I mean, you probably have, have seen it more than more than I, um, but I think the more of those, the ability you have to to communicate, I mean, just to use the general phrase, but if you're going, I mean, you mentioned it, you know, when you're going to the left, to the right, when, you know, you, you need to be able to communicate when, if you're going in front of the board, you know, as leadership, right? It's a very different conversation. You, when you're in a room with people that are concerned with how money comes in, how money goes out, and right. and these right. days, right? Who's responsible when something goes wrong, right? Yeah. Um, versus when you're in a room with or in a plant with an engineer, or and then different types of engineers, right? Or if you're in, in some with somebody from from the IT department or somebody from marketing, they're, they're always different conversations, and and being able to speak cyber, but in very plain terms, I think, and and simply, but without treating somebody like they're a child, I think is yeah. is key. That's something I've always focused on, and I think hopefully that comes across. And whether it's my LinkedIn post or the YouTube videos, it's trying to explain what might be complex or complicated you know, terms uh, in rather simple, practical. I think it's, you know, a, I think it's an to art. I think you do it well, and I think it's an art. I think that's why people really like your content is because it's extremely, well, it's technical uh, and technical enough to satisfy a lot of the technical folks, but it's general enough that the generalists can, can, can attract, you, you really attract multiple co customer profiles or, or client profiles. So I appreciate that. I, I think we've uh, got a couple more slides here. Let's, I, I actually watched some of your YouTube videos. I actually did not know that these existed, but you got like 1.7, uh, you have like 1,700 followers yeah, it, on YouTube. It's, it's amazing. Cool. It's, it's, yeah, it's, that I just, it's great. Yeah, I started putting stuff out there and it's actually picked up, yeah, traction. With, so I, I wrote the class and was actually teaching it live. Right. And then, then started realizing which is great and i would have two three hundred people live in a course which is awesome and you get a lot of great you know 
back and forth and and everybody's learning from all different you know, people just from all over the world you know in all these different environments which is really exciting and which is, i have a lot of fun doing those but at the same time it's you know somebody in india or pakistan or you know the middle east they have to stay up in the middle of the night <laughs> and which i appreciate but so being able to take that content and and re-record it to put it out on youtube i've, I've had a lot of fun with that and and uh, yeah part five is going to go up tomorrow so i'm so i'm excited so, about so tell that. us about this journey when did you do you know where did the idea come from when did you release part one and 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 how long has this been have these episodes been out not not too long so we actually so i did take two weeks completely off of linkedin and youtube because of the holidays mm -hmm. uh, and just kind of reset so i think part one went up there was like one a week so it was pretty much i think three weeks before so probably beginning of december okay and then i think we have one two three and then four uh was uh, last week so that was the return after the the holiday break break and then yeah part five tomorrow which is going to be one of the bigger bigger sections i'm actually really excited to just to nerd out because uh I'm do, we're talking active scanning building asset registers but but partly right. is active and passive hate that active scanning and passive sniffing let's say um and i have a new i've done a lot of updates to the home lab and i have a couple of additional plcs i'm working with so i can actually show a lot more uh than just use some you know packet captures we download off the internet <laughs> so super so i'm excited cool. about that one super cool well i don't <coughs> i don't know too many folks that have built hours and hours and hours of their own videos uh and make it you know free and available so kudos to you what's after episode five or are you letting the kind of the 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 market respond to you first it looks like it's super positive what do you what do you have planned next sir yeah so we're gonna finish out the series so it's probably going to ultimately be i think 10 maybe, maybe a little bit more um and then i want to go back to finish building out the rest of my classes uh i'm starting to do some training for individual uh, you know um, companies and uh, into state entities, which is really uh, fun, where they're bringing in like utility providers from the state uh, right. and and doing training, which I think is really awesome. So I'm doing that, you know, not outside of my day job, but I have a lot of obviously, probably I have a lot of fun doing training. Um, so I'm also building a more specific course around six two four four three because it's this incredible standard right. that we talk about in building out a cybersecurity program in in OT environments. But at the same time, it's it, it's like any standard. It's like here it is, and it's like, well, I just want to know practically, right? How do I implement this? And There's a lot of yeah, a lot of people point to it. Um, but there's an incredible amount of data acumen alignment between your team and parties to yeah. get that standard or those series off the ground and really in place. That's why we see them in multi-year sprints. Um, I'm excited to hear about that. Um, very cool. Well, from one content developer to the next, I'll tell you, there's uh, pretty awesome content out there, folks. Um, appreciate what you're doing on these on these YouTube videos, Mike. Um, yeah, I appreciate that. One, one of the things that you and I had talked about, every everybody that is developing content in some way has something they do really well. And these are the videos. But I have always thought that your long form written content on LinkedIn was was pretty powerful, right? It's detail oriented. Um, there's a lot of information packed in there. And proof of that is how many comments that you get, how many people are looking at them. So what I personally yeah. ask folks is that he put up on the slide deck some of the top 10 posts. And I would encourage you to go and look at Mike's LinkedIn profile and find some of these posts because there's there's real gems within it, but the comments below are pretty awesome. It's something to uh, to, to really study. Walk us through some of these. Yeah, and just a minute, you can learn a ton from from the comments. I learn a ton from from the comments because right. you know, just it's amazing all the the people that are out there on, on LinkedIn that you can learn from. Um, and just as a as a cheat, so last week because kind of coming back from the holiday and a new year, I one of my posts was here's my top ten posts from 2023. So I started posting about eight eight months ago, um, almost nine, I guess, back in May. 
and so it's it's really easy to say oh here's here's my top 10 posts of of all time um but yeah you can see it and it's interesting to see what people gravitate to, right? But it's, you know, how, what's the number one per, way to protect, you know, ICS OT environments, right? That's, that's my big viral post out of all of them. Uh, and it's really just comes down to, yeah. We, and as Rob Lee, you know, will say, it's just organization, they need a firewall. <laughs> they don't need zero trust or the latest shiny tool. It's, they need a firewall, right? Or, or we can say, let's, let's better configure it. So, if possible, and I know this isn't you know available in every environment, but you know, we don't want network connections to originate from IT and move into OT because when the attacker gets into IT, they're just going to use that as a path to get into the OT network. So we allow you know OT to send information or push it to IT, but not the other way around. So right. so that's one I talk a, a lot about. Uh, that also falls in number three, but it's more specific to to AD. Um, number two actually came about because of the you know the we had the cyber avengers still one of the worst worst names for for a hacktivist group right but we had the iranian hacktivists you targeting water treatment facilities and and there was a picture that somebody put up in the plc uh subreddit uh that i saw it was from a, a hacked plc that they hit uh, in a brewery and, right. and so it, a lot of people joke, right? Critical infrastructure. And and so I took that picture and, and put it out there, which I thought was really, really fascinating. Um, so, you know, what's the difference between ICS and, and OT? Because that's, that's, that's just a big question people have, you know, it's kind of what's really even ICS or OT or, or what's the big deal, right? But again, right. It, it's very different if you're sitting at a desk in a cubicle in a back office or working from home these days versus if you're standing in a, in a power plant or, or a chemical refinery. It's completely, you know, two, two different worlds. And then, of course, sense. yeah, and then, and then, of course, certifications. So talking about whether it's SANS, which are incredible. And I always suggest that people that have the resources, the the grid class that's, that Rob Lee does, not only to take it with him, but just the, the content. It's the one course I've ever seen or even come close to seeing that it really teaches you how to defend OT environments. And it right. makes it simple, right? right? He just does an incredible job. Of, yeah. of making it simple and practical and teaching you how to get the job done. So. Very cool. Very cool. Well, our final slide, walk us through kind of the other six through 10 and uh, sure. maybe which one was your favorite. Uh, ooh, out of these, that's a good question. Um, the first, uh, kind of the first couple that, you know, we talk about either NMAP or my number one tip for becoming a better cyber defender, whether it's, you know, ICSOT or an IT is, is learning to be a, pen tester that's how i got into pen testing i remember 20 plus years ago, before it was called pen testing right but it was this idea that if i wanted to really better understand how to defend my environments it's i had to understand how the attackers broke in and not just read a book about it but actually do it, do it. Yeah. yeah, and that's how I got into pen testing, and then of course that translates from IT pen testing into uh, OT pen testing, which is it's one of those areas that's very different in in those two worlds. Yeah. So, but how you know how how does that map work in in ICS OT, and and how does pen testing work in in ICS OT? Because again, it's very very different because we don't want to run an end map scan or or. We're, we're running around using Metasploit to exploit a break into a system that could potentially lead to somebody dying, right? There's, there's serious consequences. And so it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very different. So very cool. And then, but. well, I, uh, removing that really appreciate you coming on board. The, uh, you know, the people side of this ecosystem is, uh, it's it's our number one asset and if we and if we don't take the time to really think about mentoring uh training and, and growing this this ecosystem then it truly doesn't get better you know something that i've always yeah. said in any business that that uh, that i have or a team that i lead is you know the team and the business does not grow it's people within those organizations when they grow as an individual they make people around them better and the company or the team or the maturity of your assets, it'll yeah. naturally follow. Yep, absolutely. So 
you know, kudos to you and thank you for the content that you develop, Mike. Uh, I, I know how much Thanks. work it takes and, um, you know, give you the final word on, on how to improve or, or enter into ICS uh, for, our, for our viewers. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's, you know, try to try to spell out, but we kind of touched on it. It's if it's something that you really feel the need to do, you know, don't just continue to pursue it and and take all of those options that we they put on the table. Um, and, you know, it's you'll probably have better success with with a few of those items, you know, not all 10 and, and some are different for it's just you I think we have different paths that we all take th different things will click and and you will find your your way there um it does happen it just it will it takes time and it that's does one thing is, is that passion is the patience and the passion right is, is really what it comes down to and the perseverance i guess we can have lots of p words uh but it's really what it comes down to but if you know people have questions comments you check out the ebooks, but if you have questions after you check those out, feel free to reach out on, on LinkedIn and, or you can get me at mikeholcomb.com uh, and be more than happy to answer questions. Yeah, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, closing out the first episode of the Business of Cyber Series for 24, Mr. Mike Holcomb, you heard it here. Passion, patience, and perseverance. Getting started and growing within ICS is not easy, but with the content and the guidance from folks like Mike, it's a little bit easier and a little bit more accessible. Mike, thank you for joining. Everybody have a great 2024. Talk soon. Thanks, Ed. <laughs> Thanks, everyone.